My name is Joe Peroni, and this is the Rise Above Project. And today what I want to do is I want to go through the original essay by Peggy McIntosh, and it's entitled White Privilege Unpacking the Invisible Knapsack. Last week I did talk about white privilege and white fragility, but this week I want to get into the details, number one, and I also want to get into why this is becoming such a big deal lately. And we've got it word for word here, so I'm gonna go through it. I'm not gonna go through it all, because uh, number one, she's not a very good writer, and number two, she has so many complaints here that it's just hard to go through them all. I could be here for two hours doing this. But I wanna be fair. So Peggy McIntosh wrote this in 1988. That's a long time ago. And one of my thoughts was, why is this becoming so popular now? Because when she wrote this in 1988, her ideas died of loneliness. Nobody really caught on to it. Nobody really cared. And because probably a lot of people didn't agree with it. But nowadays we have this younger generation and they're, they're jumping on it. We have a very soft world right now. We have a lot of people that have become very victim oriented and people who don't want to take personal responsibility. And so because of those changes in society, I think people are much more open to pointing fingers at other people instead of looking at what they can do to make their lives better. So I want to go over this in detail. However, just to start this off, what I want to do is I want to give you one anecdotal example, but you're going to understand what I'm saying and why I'm saying it. I think teaching white privilege and telling people to accept it, especially when they're young, when they, their critical analysis skills are not very good, it's going to cause even more problems down the road. I'm going to give you an example of a type of client that I have had. And I'm gonna put a bunch of stories together so I'm not just talking about one person. So here's the story. So I have this uh, lady. She's a black lady, she's in her 30s. And she proceeds to tell me her story. And she's still angry, she feels aggrieved, she's annoyed, she hates the world, she hates white people, and she hates cops. So let's go down this list. So she starts off by telling me that she stayed at home and she was getting drunk. Okay, no problem. You can get drunk at home. But she decides that it might be a good idea to go out and go for, go for a drive. So now she's driving drunk. What she notices after a while is that a cop is following her and wants her to pull over. She decides that Cops are bad people, that this could get very bad for her. So she decides to outrun the cops. So now, of course, she's drunk driving, trying to outrun the cops. She's not doing a good job of it. There's no way she could. She ends up crashing. Cops get out. She decides it's a good idea to jump out of the car and start punching the cops in the face. So, of course, as you go down the road, she was arrested and she was thrown in, in prison for a while. So now I'm talking to her. Her side of the story is if she was white, if she had blonde hair, she wouldn't have received such, such a harsh punishment. And I actually agree with part of that because I think the numbers are pretty clear that in terms of legalities, I think, well, I don't have to think, I know it's a fact. Black people don't get treated very fairly in terms of the law. It's been shown time and time again that for the same crime, black people are gonna do more time. That's 100% like wrong, obviously. I think we all know this. So you can't say that there's a level of systemic racism. Absolutely 100%. And I do agree with a lot of uh, black people who say that you do need to teach their kids to be a little bit wary of cops because you don't have a lot of a lot of room for error. You're going to have to toe the line because a cop can, and they have, and they do get out of line. However, when we're teaching white privilege, what we're totally missing here 
is the personal responsibility. So this lady, after all these years, now in her mid-40s, is still thinking that it's a color problem. It's the color or the tone of her skin that was the problem. She didn't think it was a problem to get drunk. She didn't think it was a problem to go driving while she was drunk. She didn't think it was a problem to try to outrun the cops. And she didn't think it was a problem to start punching cops in the face. So when you really look at it from the outside, I'm trying to see both sides here. Yeah, she's going to probably get a harsher punishment, maybe, because she's black. However, how, do, how many wrong things do you have to do in order to start looking at yourself and saying, I could have handled this better? On top of that, I would say that if it was a white man who jumped out of a car and started punching cops in the face, they probably would have killed him. With her, she's literally punching people. And she's living to tell about it, with, and she had no injuries. It means that they treated her with the most kid gloves they possibly could. That's what it tells me. So that's one of the things I think is very bad about teaching this white privilege. I don't think it's bad to teach it in terms of like there are differences here and there, and I know that there are, obviously. But to teach it in a way that becomes dogmatic, that says white people are this, black people are that, and you don't have to have any responsibility whatsoever for your socioeconomic conditions or your choices. I think what that, what's that, that does is it, it, it's harmful for everybody. I don't care about the tone of, the, of your skin. It doesn't matter. What matters is, is that if you do are trying to find a way to live up to your best capabilities, your values, your virtues. You can't just say, I got treated worse than somebody else. However, <laughs> you're assaulting people. That's the bottom line. So let's move on with this. Interesting thing Peggy McIntosh says here. She says, as we in women's studies work to reveal male privilege, so she's against men and uh, white men. She says, as we ask men to give up some of their power, so one who writes about having white privilege must ask, having described it, what will I do to lessen or end it? Okay, here's a victim mentality. If anybody has power, why would you give it up? You are supposed to try to do the best you can in your life. If somebody's making X amount of dollars, what are they gonna donate their money to somebody else just because? It's incumbent on everybody to do the best that they can. You shouldn't expect people to do worse to make somebody else feel better. It's one of the basic tenets of psychology, especially when we're talking about marriage and family therapy. If you're in a relationship with somebody where you have to make yourself less and less and less attractive, in order to satisfy somebody else because they might be jealous, envious, or just have no self-esteem or no ability or no ambition to get better, you're in the wrong relationship. So, but if you're teaching this in society, well, then you're in the wrong society as well. Because if you're literally gonna teach people in a capitalistic society that they need to make less of themselves, they need to be less educated, have less money, have less goods and services, to make somebody else feel better, how is that ever gonna help them? I mean, I'm liberal. If I make it in the world, I have no problem giving you a ladder so you can climb up that ladder as well. And I'll pay my taxes, I'll do the right things, I'll support the right policies for people on the lower income to move up to the top. But it's on you to develop a skill. It's on you to go to college. It's on you to do these things and work hard. Not to get drunk, not to punch cops in the face. All right, so let's get down to some more basics with Peggy McIntosh. She says, if I, I can, if I wish, arrange to be in the company of people of my race most of the time. I don't think that that's white privilege. First of all, if you're trying to just be in the company of people of your own race, that's, I don't know, could be a preference, it could be racism. I'm not sure what she's talking about. So um, the question for me is like, why would you want to arrange to be only in the company of people of your own race? 
I don't think I've ever done that. I don't think I know anybody that said, hey, Bob, let's invite a bunch of people over to a party that are only white so we can be among our own race. Like, I've never heard that before. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. Like, I so I don't even know what she's talking about. It, it seems kind of racist to me. In trying to give her the benefit of the doubt, would it be easier to arrange to be in the company of people of, of your own race if you're white? Of course, but that's called majority privilege because black people take up about 13% of the population. So if you want to be around black people and you're black, you have less to choose from, I guess, right? Like you can have all the friends in the world, but overall you're only 13% of the population whereas white people take up about 65% of the population. So just by a sheer majority, if you're white, you have more opportunity to be around white people. Actually, black people have more opportunity to be around white people too. So Peggy McIntosh in that area, again, she is ignorant as the day is long. Uh, let's go on to her next assertion. If I should need to move, I can be pretty sure of renting or purchasing housing in an area which I can afford and in which I want to live. Again, we're talking about class here. Uh, we're talking about economics. We're not talking about color of skin. The average apartment in Las Vegas where I live is somewhere between, now there's a big range here, but we're looking at between $1,200 to $2,000 a month. That's really not affordable for anybody, no matter what your skin color is. I don't know what she's talking about. Again, that's not a white privilege thing. Like, and plus, I come from a poor family. <laughs> like, it's not a white privilege to be able to go into any nice area you want and live there. That's not that. I mean, just because I'm a white man, nobody came over to me and handed me a house. Like, that's ridiculous. That doesn't make sense. Let's look at number three she talks about here. I can be pretty sure that my neighbors in such a location will be neutral or pleasant to me. Again, this has nothing to do with the, your skin tone. Let's be honest here. Most neighborhoods are segregated. Whether, I mean, it's just the way people are. They tend to move in with people that they feel comfortable with in certain areas. It's segregated by money. It's segregated by culture. It can be segregated by race. So what is she talking about here? Is she talking about if a black person moves into an area where people are also black, why does she have a feeling that those people won't be neutral or at least nice to them? Actually, this is really racist because she's saying that black people aren't friendly. <laughs> so that makes no sense. Like, I don't think she's saying what she thinks she's trying to accomplish here. I mean, is she saying that black neighborhoods are more dangerous? Therefore, a white person who has white privilege can live in a white neighborhood and therefore those neighbors there will be nicer? That doesn't make sense. You can also say, and try to give the benefit of the doubt, what if a black person moves into a predominantly white neighborhood? I don't know if that... Uh, I've never, I've never done that. But what I could say probably is there would be some apprehension on a lot of white people because they're hoping that that person upholds the level and the culture of everybody else in that neighborhood. I mean, for example, um, I live in a, in, in a nice neighborhood. Uh, it's pretty well mixed. I've got one family, uh, the Section 8 housing. They live near me. They're black. They, don't, they have privilege in a sense, because if I have like even a, a, a little bit of a couple of weeds poking through, I, I immediately, the, uh, the HOA gets on my back and they find me. Well, in this household that's next to me, they never get fined. They've got two cars outside that haven't moved in, in about, I don't know, three years. They're on blocks. They're inside the cars. They're not drivable because they're filled up with garbage. They've got this fence that is not HOA approved that they put on the side. They, I mean, it's the Asian lady who lives next to me. She actually pulls up their weeds when she has, to, when she feels like she needs to because she wants to keep her property value up. And there's like eight black people who live in this house. Now I'm not making fun of them. It's, it is what it is. I know it's stereotypical, 
in a sense, and it all, and, but it's not racist to say the truth. This is what I, and everybody in my area is worried about their property values going down. Now, it doesn't matter about the color of their skin. If anybody acted in this way, and the HOA didn't get on their back, everybody would be like, why is this? Why are they getting this special privilege that is actually knocking down the, the housing values of everybody in, in, in my area? Like, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if they're Asian. If they're, it could have been me. If I was sitting out there with, <laughs> with junky cars in, in my driveway and not moving them for a couple of years, I'd be getting a knock on my door every five seconds. Let's continue. She says, uh, number four, I can go shopping alone most of the time, pretty well assured that I will not be followed or harassed. Again, I'm not black, so I don't know. Uh, it's possible, again. But I could tell you this, too. I've been in har harassed at stores many, many times. I mean, back in the day, I went to nest featherings, and I was about maybe 28 years old. I was trying to get furniture for my house that I just bought, and it was the first real house that I ever lived in that I bought because I was in an apartment my whole life. And they follow, they did follow me around, you know. Then I came in another time, and the lady came over to me and said, oh, we don't accept solicitors here. I don't know what that meant I, at the time. I think she thought I was selling something. I don't know. But they basically threw me out of the store. You know, it's a very expensive store. I guess they assumed that because I went in there wearing my workout clothes that I was unfit to buy any of their products. So this happens. Uh, did it happen because of the color of my skin? No, but it happened because I looked like I was poor. And that does happen sometimes. Uh, moving on. She says, I can turn on the television or open to the front page of the paper and see people of my race widely represented. My first thought here is to give Peggy McIntosh a little bit of a break because she wrote this in 1988. And that's what I was gonna say, like you can't compare years because if you look at TV right now, again, black people take up 13% of the population, they are overrepresented in TV. I mean, you, you mentioned it, uh, movies, in music. They're overrepresented. That's just a fact. Did Peggy McIntosh know that when she wrote that in 1988? She couldn't have. But here's the thing, though. She wrote this in 1988. The top three shows, or the, the top two, that were flipping back and forth. Number one was The Cosby Show in 1988. The other one was called Another World, was a, which was an offshoot with Lisa Bonet which is, again, it was a, uh, a spin-off of The Cosby Show. Sometimes that show was number two, sometimes it was number three. But either way, quote-unquote black shows were the top shows in 1988. So I don't know, again, what she's talking about. It makes no sense. They also have the, the Black Entertainment Network. Now, to be fair, and I don't even know if it's still on, but they do have like a country music station, a television show. But here's the thing, it's country music. Yes, more white people than black people like country music, but they don't call it the white entertainment network. Whereas in black entertainment, they say black entertainment network, which is interesting because white people have no problem buying any type of music or entertainment from black people. Again, this is not a racism thing. I think it just might be preference. Because you could take somebody like Robert Cray, who, who's an excellent blues guitar player, and he's black. I go to that show, and it's a good mix of black and white people. Then you can go to Eric Clapton, let's say, for example, or John Mayer, both playing the same type of blues music, but John Mayer and Eric Clapton are white. You go there, and it's 99.9% .9 white people there. Is it because black people don't like that kind, of, that kind of music? No, they love that kind of music. That's why they see, you know, they, they love blues. So we all like blues. So again, I don't think it's racism. I think it's just preference is what it seems like to be. And if we're talking about watching sports, again, about 70 to 75 to 80% of the athletes, if we're looking at sports like, say, basketball or football, they tend to be more black. So again, overrepresented there. Should we complain about that? No, they, they earned it. If they're better athletes, they should be playing. 
and they should be on TV and they should be getting the big contracts. That makes sense to me. Continuing, uh, Peggy McIntosh mentions, let me flip the page here. I could go into a music shop and count on finding the music of my race represented. Okay, let's talk about that. That's ridiculous. Black people are actually more successful in music than white people are. And part of it is because of what I was hinting before. Black people very rarely support white musicians. I mean, they do, but not at the same level. Ask yourself how many black people love the Beatles or the Eagles or, you know, people like this. Or you know, trying to get a black person to admit that Elvis Presley had a good voice is like, it's, it's difficult to happen. However, when it's the opposite way, I mean, who were the biggest artists in 1988? Right? Again, Peggy McIntosh is writing this in 1988. And let's see if I can find this quote again. I can go into a music shop and count on finding the music of my race represented. In other words, black people can. Well, in 1988, the two most popular musicians were Michael Jackson and Prince. They're black. So again, she's 100% wrong. There's, there is no other side to that story. And if you want to fast forward to today to see if she's right, hip hop and rap music is the number one selling music right now primarily black. So again, she's 100% wrong. There's a complete over-representation of black entertainment. Let's continue. She said, I can go into a supermarket and find the staple foods which fit into my cultural traditions. Again, is this true? I mean, America is a great place to live, right? You can call it a salad, you can call it a melting pot, call it whatever you want. But one of the best things is that we all have different cultures and we can all find these cultures if we want to. And again, if you take up 13% of the population, unless it's extremely popular with people outside your race, you're only gonna stay at that 13%. So let's take a quick look at this. If we're looking at staple foods, is it possible to think that we don't have enough Chinese food places. I live in Las Vegas. There's one on every corner. There's not enough Mexican food places. <laughs> They're all over the place. Uh, Japanese place. Yeah, there's all that. Italian places. Of course. Can you find these foods everywhere? You can. I don't know what she's talking about. If you're going to talk about maybe having which I guess you would call soul food or black cuisine, that's probably true. But it's capitalism. I don't think a lot of people like that kind of food, and that's probably just the truth of it. I mean, if we're talking about soul food, we're talking about fried chicken, okra, collard greens, chitlins, uh, pig's knuckles, pig's intestines. Like, come on, I don't even think black people like that kind of food. So let's be honest. The reason why it's not highly represented is because people don't want it. It's capitalism. Continuing. She also mentions, and this is hard to go through because she shoehorns so many things into one sentence. She's all over the place. But she also throws in this. She said, I can go into a hairdresser's shop and find someone who can cut my hair. Again, it's percentage. It's a different skill to work on black hair. Now, my girlfriend's a hairdresser and my uncle owned a hair salon. So I've been around salons a lot and I know a little bit about it, kind of. But from what I've been told, and I could be wrong, that most black people are not going to trust a white person to do their hair. Doing black hair is a special skill. And in capitalism, if there is a need, what you need to do is fill that need. And so it's incumbent upon more people to be able to do that service. And you would think more black people would step up and go to cosmetology school and handle that. White people, I'm sure, can do it as well. But again, if you're trying to gain a skill to do that and it only takes up 13% of the population, you're gonna aim for, for where the, the money is. So again, it's a capitalism issue. It's not a white privilege issue. Let's continue. Uh, number 10, she says, whether I use Checks, credit cards, cash, I can count on my skin color not to work against the appearance of financial reliability. 
again, we just have to go by facts here. Let's look at uh, FICO scores or credit scores. And what we're looking at here at the top of the list is Asian, then it goes white, Hispanic, and black. So again, it's just facts. If you move up the ladder and you're more successful and you have a higher credit score than your average Asian or white person, and the whole community is working on that and they all do better, guess what? People will look at you a little bit differently. Number 11, I can arrange to protect my children most of the time from people who might not like them. I don't know what that means. Um, she's fishing here. Uh, might not like them? Nobody can control that. If she's saying that somebody might be dangerous and harmful to them, she's admitting that in black neighborhoods that are more dangerous, which I wouldn't say that. I, I would say it's based on economics. Because if, if people have less things, they don't have food, they don't have basic services, they're going to be more angry and there's more chance of the crime rate going up. That just makes sense. Let's look at number 12. She said, I can swear, uh, dress in secondhand clothes or not answer letters without having people attribute these choices to bad morals or poverty or the illiteracy of my race. Um, I, again, this isn't white privilege. This is just basic stuff. We were taught manners when we were young. We were taught not to do anything to embarrass yourself, your family, your culture, the people in your neighborhood. If everybody was taught this, then everything would be better. Now, if we're talking about like not responding to people's letters, that's just bad etiquette. It doesn't matter about the color of your skin. If you don't respond to people, you don't act decent, you don't send out thank you notes or letters, you're just kind of a, maybe an irresponsible person. It has nothing to do with the color of your skin. Continuing, let's see. Uh, I am never asked to speak for all the people of my racial group. Again, not totally sure what she means by that, but okay, so people see me as Italian, although if I'm being 100%, I do have some Irish in me and some Spanish. That kind of doesn't matter, right? But how many times do people come up to me and say, hey, where's the best Italian restaurant? Okay, does that mean I'm speaking for all Italians? They'll ask me, what is it like to be Italian and, and to have lived in New York? Well, I'm just one guy. Am I speaking for every Italian? Like, people think that. They, they look at me and they immediately go, oh, okay, so you were in the mafia? So it, it's, it's insane to think that this only happens to black people. It's not white privilege here. It's Peggy McIntosh is really struggling hard with her own issues. And I, I'm not sure what they are. I'm not here to judge her. Well, as a human, I mean, I can judge her work, but um, she is really off base. Let's look at uh, the next one, she says. If a traffic cop pulls me over or if an I the IRS audits my tax return, I can be sure I haven't been singled out because of my race. You can never be sure of anything. I don't care. I've been pulled over um, when I didn't have a lot of money and my car broke down in a ritzy part of Long Island. The cop came by and I thought, well, thank God this guy's gonna help me. He said, if you don't move this car in an hour, we're going to tow it. I told him, I don't even have any money to tow the car. He said, that's your problem. Is that, is that being treated well? No, it's not about skin tone. It's about, I didn't have, uh, I couldn't make their town look good when I had a broken down car on the side of the road. So they were just going to delete me. Uh, moving on. I can easily buy posters, postcards, picture books, dolls, toys, and magazines featuring people of my race. Again, this is majority privilege, has nothing to do with white privilege. If you take up 13% of the people, you're probably going to get about 13% of the magazines and dolls. That just makes sense. Continuing. She says... I can be sure that if I need legal or medical help, my race will not work against me. Okay, well, again, I'm not black, so I don't know, but I can tell you this, I have been to the doctor, I have been to hospitals, and the first thing that they ask you is, they don't say what's the color of your skin, they don't care about that, even though you know, they can see you. The thing that they wanna know is, do you have insurance or do you have cash? That's it, you can go there doubled over in pain, and I know because I was at some point, and they just go, hey, do you have insurance? We need to see your insurance card. That's what it is. They don't go, oh my God, you're white. Come on in for free. They don't do that. It doesn't make any sense. 
Continuing, I can go home from most meetings of organizations I belong to and feeling somewhat tied in rather than isolated. Okay, this, this makes no sense, and I'll tell you this real quick. As a marriage and family therapist, again, this has nothing to, get to do with the color of my skin. I worked at a, a drug rehab for a while. We would have a meeting. Let's say it's on Monday at 11 a.m. 20 therapists are there. Like 19 of them are women. Then you have me. They have a big bowl of candy in the middle of the of a desk. And everybody's like grabbing it, grabbing it, grabbing it like it's the last food on the face of the planet. And then in between sessions, they're outside smoking cigarettes. So I didn't want any part of this. They would ask me a question. I would have an answer. They wouldn't necessarily like my point of view. So what happened is I got thrown out of all the meetings. So I had to have a special meeting by myself on Fridays. Now, again, I'm white. Okay, I'm supposed to feel comfortable in these meetings because of the color of my skin. That made no sense. Okay, like that doesn't make any sense at all. I've also gone for job interviews. There was one, I was on the third interview at this one place. She finally looks at me and she says, your type of masculinity is not needed in this place. My type of masculinity? No, I'm a man, period. So the fact that they can say it out loud and not feel that there's going to be any repercussions is amazing to me. Let me show you some more quick little things here because I find it super interesting. Here's your white male privilege for you. Here's a grief summit conference that I may or may not go to because I need credits to continue my license. I'm gonna show you this real quick. There are eight people that are presenters. Do you see any men? I don't. Where's my privilege? Let me show you another one. Here's a play therapy summit. There's a man here and there's a man somewhere. But I think there's, I think overall there's something like 12 women or 12 women and two men. So again, I want to cash in on my privilege. Where is it? It's not there. Continuing, she says, if my day, week, or year is going badly, I need not ask each negative episode or situation whether it has racial overtones. Right, and you, and you shouldn't, even if there is some type of over, overtone. Like, there's an overtone because I'm a white male, I get pushed out of things, but is it my job to try to control things that I can't control? No. Is it my job to whine, cry, and complain and take on the victim mentality so I never actually try? No. So I think teaching this to people to say, listen, if, you're, if your day is going bad or if your year is going bad, you need to like really do some soul searching and figure out how many people are victimizing you because of your skin tone. I just don't find that to be incredibly helpful. Although sometimes it might be true in certain circumstances, Okay, good, so what's the prize? Somebody discriminated against you because of your, the color of your skin. Okay, what's the next move? Sit at home and get drunk? Or try to be a better person? I would say be a better person. Because I've been discriminated against in a lot of ways. I've been discriminated against because I was Catholic. Uh, somebody, a girlfriend a long time ago, was like, no way is that guy gonna be with my daughter? You know, I mean, it, it is that way. It, you can be discriminated against for a lot of things. It doesn't matter. You got to keep pushing forward. And let's see what else. Here's a fun, interesting one that I'd like to end on because the show is pretty long again. She says, let's try to read this straight through because it's funny. I can choose blemish cover or bandages in flesh color and have them more or less match my skin. Is that a big white privilege, really? The color of Band-Aids we're talking about? And you know what? <laughs> Here's the thought. If I had this on, would you know that I have a Band-Aid on? Like, is it really white privilege that I can get this color Band-Aid? Does it really make my life better? And is it so good, so perfect with my skin that you could never see that I'm wearing this. You would never mention it, right? Like I can definitely go to work with a Band-Aid across my face and no one would know because of my white privilege because this Band-Aid matches so well. And by the way, 
You're just trying to stop the bleeding. This isn't a white privilege thing. You can get band-aids of all different colors. As a matter of fact, when we were kids, we would want like the yellow ones or the ones with the little faces on it to make it funny. This isn't something to get black people feeling bad about. Like, oh my God, the USA, for all its greatness and glory, it sucks as a country because you can't get black band-aids. Like this is the dumbest thing ever. So let me finish with this. I think you know how I feel about this. I think I'll do maybe one more show on this because I have a lot to say. I want to do a show about rising above. This isn't rising above. This is trying to, Peggy McIntosh wrote this whole essay to help people be better victims and to put the blame on everybody else in society and expect people who have education, who have good salaries, good educations, whatever they might have, and they, they should give them up for people who don't have that. And by the way, if you continue to strive to work harder, to be better, you may not reach the top, you may not reach the best of what you wanna do, but you know what? You're not gonna be depressed. You're gonna feel good about yourself for giving it your best shot and trying every day and taking positive actions. So taking positive actions to do the best you can should be the goal and should be what people like Peggy McIntosh should have been saying but did not say. And unfortunately, because of the way our society is going today, Peggy McIntosh is being put on this like pedestal. Like she said something so great and intelligent. I think we should go back to 1988. What she said back then, every single one of her ideas should absolutely die of loneliness. Because if you follow any of the things she says, your life is gonna be worse off for it. My name is Joe Peroni. This is the Rise Above Project. Hopefully this had some value to you. Please subscribe and tell a friend. Thank you.